Friday's Fast Track Grad Live Show. I've got Professor Courtney McNamara in the studio. This is going to be an awesome session. I know I say that every time, but this one's really good because we're going to look at a manuscript that one of the members of the group feels a little bit uncertain about. And we're going to look at how to detect gaps. It's a theme we talk about a lot in this group, but you're actually going to see it live in that real world example of the manuscript I just mentioned. We had several questions on structuring literature reviews. Some students in the group have been feeling lost, feel like they're just inefficient and going in circles. So if you are writing a literature review or you're thinking about one, definitely not going to want to miss this. And we had another query from the group about where to find some of our best free writing training, which is awesome. I'm really happy to share that with you guys. So uh, we're going to dive straight in. You guys might even want to take notes, but you can always catch up on the replay. If you are on Team Replay, let us know. Just comment replay in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. And we always go back after and answer everybody who's got a query. Uh, and with that, Courtney, let's jump straight into this week's quick tip. So my quick Top tip this week is to be very intentional about growing your professional network. And we've talked about this a little bit um, in these channels before, but it's a lesson that I, I just learn over and over again as time goes on um, in my career is don't let your network grow just by chance. You should be very intentional about thinking about always certain steps you can do, events you can plan, um, how you can meet people in your area, because um, it, it's it's a huge, just a little bit of work. It has a huge payoff, really. Mm. When you say be intentional, is that do you do? You, would you go so far as to say, Courtney, make an explicit strategy or target certain people who you think would be interesting and then bump into them somehow? I mean, how, how would you do that <laughs> and, and not be creepy? Or especially yeah. if you're an introvert, right? That right, can be right, right. Particularly hard. Yeah, there's different ways to do it. So if you if there's a conference coming up in your area, go to it look at who's speaking, um, read some of their papers, think of questions you might ask them. Um, if you're an introvert, there's of course ways to, to do that as well. Um, you can ask questions to them during different, like in between panel sessions or something, not necessarily in front of a large group. Um, consider looking on Twitter and linking um, with people there and, and um, putting yourself out there and, and contributing to conversations there. Uh, Those I are think, just two examples, but there's lots of different uh, ways to do yeah, it. Yeah, I think that's really important. I mean, sometimes I think there's there's a mentality, well, if I publish good papers and I do the right things, success is going to come my way. And really, the same strategies that you might have to use it in other fields and career paths, the same actually do apply to the university. These are important soft skills that we're often not taught. But if you look at people really, really yeah. successful um, sometimes it make it seem like, oh, they publish all these great papers, but there's more to it than that. They've gotten themselves embedded in the right networks so that they could find winning ideas so that they could publish regularly. So glad you mentioned that. Speaking of networks on the conference circuit, by the way, Courtney, I'm going to be at European Public Health Association. My, my core field is uh, social science and medicine. And so looking forward to that. If any of you are in Berlin, November 9th to 12th, I'm going to be there. Stop by, say hello. Are you going to that one, Courtney? Uh, so no, it, it overlaps with the American Public Health Association. So I'll oh, be okay. at the American one. Right. So if anyone's there, you can All hit right. me up. Uh, across the bonds. And look, even if you're not in the field, the reason we set up Fast Track is because, you know, when I was a grad student, uh, I still remember that November when my back was against the wall, I couldn't figure out my topic and I was going to miss my assignment and I was at risk of flunking out. And what I've come to learn after now, flash forward, I became a professor at Harvard and then full professor at Oxford, now Bocconi, Milan, uh, where I'm tenured. Uh, um, you know, it's not necessarily the best or the brightest students who succeed. Um, it, in fact, sometimes that extra intelligence can be a curse, especially if you're trying to do everything just on your own. And so I set up this group specifically because I had so many kind of speed bumps along the way that led me to suffer and lose time that I want to make sure that doesn't happen to you. And so created this as a critical base of support, community, and networking to help you truly thrive and make the most of this critical time that you're investing in yourselves. So if you haven't already, do join our Facebook group. Get directly in touch with Courtney and I every Friday. This is a golden opportunity for you to get the kind of unfiltered, raw feedback. It's like having two professors uh, working in your corner as an assistant to help you thrive. So with that, let me go jump straight through, Courtney, to some of the uh, comments and submissions we got this week. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. 
And uh, let's uh, read out a couple of these. So, yep, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so we've got one uh, who's asking us, where can we find, uh, here we go, I'm going to say this. Can you please guide on the best resources of Dr. Rini to find articles and improve writing skills? And yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Let me share with you in the Facebook group. Um, some of you may not, not realize, but if you, you actually have a search functionality. And so one of the writing trainings we use a lot is our peer system. Mm -hmm. And there's a fantastic training. One of our previous lives Go straight here and you're going to find it. You're not going to want to miss that. Um, you can also find it on our YouTube channel. And the other thing that you're not going to want to miss is go into our guide section and you're going to find, you know, it was 30 hours. It's now closer to 60, um, free masterclasses. Um, the same stuff that I've kind of passed down informally on soft skills and actually taught in classrooms at, at Harvard and Oxford over the years. We've got systematic review courses. Um, we've got mindset training, productivity training, how to build your network, what Courtney was just talking about. We've got some dedicated worksheets and training. You're not going to want to miss that. Um, and writing training along with outlines, helpful planners and uh, worksheets to help you really thrive. So don't miss that. And if you ever have trouble uh, accessing it, do reach out to the assistant in the group. Right now, that's Handy Tugrel. Um, she's actually one of my PhD students here at University of Bocconi. She's really fantastic, has the same passion uh, that we have for helping you guys become the best versions of yourselves. So glad you asked that. Okay, I'm going to come in and look at a few other questions that we've got that are more structured um, in the group. And uh, so we've got a question here that came from Cynthia. And Cynthia uh, writes, I want to know how to consolidate my studies and uh, literature review uh, when writing my thesis. So you know, almost every thesis, almost every research paper, whatever you're doing, you're going to need a literature review. And it's very easy to feel lost and go in circles on that. And we actually got had another question this time from Sharon. That is too big to put in the, the chat. And Sharon says, I'd like to know for my literature review how to synthesize different aspects that inform my area of study. Disability, theories, gender, uh, identity, education, etc. Um, so that's a really good question. And I'm going to pull up a Word document to go through that. But Courtney, what, give us some of your best thoughts here on um, how to go about Cynthia's questions. How do you start consolidating these studies in the literature review? Yeah, I think well, there's multiple ways, but the basic idea behind it is that you you need to find a central organizational strategy. So finding um, um, some sort of themes that are running through, or perhaps there's a conceptual framework in your field that would be a useful way to to organize and talk about the studies in your literature review. Hey, Courtney, what's a, if some people, I mean, I, I, just assuming zero background knowledge, what, what do you mean by conceptual framework? Yeah, so conceptual frameworks are, well, you could create them yourself, but when they're already in the field, they are, um, let's see how to put this. Um, they're sort of maps, mind maps, or maps for how ideas connect to each other or, or mechanisms that link, um, you know, dependent, uh, dependent variables to independent ones. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so you're saying you, you need to find a structure, and a good way to find that structure might be to just lift off the shelf a conceptual framework uh, from, from your field. For example, if I were going to look at, coming back to my, my field health, if I want to look at, say, the impact on health, I might disaggregate and say, okay, what are the impacts on physical health, and what are the impacts on mental health? Um, but what's really important is you're going to have this big mess of information, and at the core of what we're doing, whatever your field is, we're scientists. And science, taking the word literally to know, is we are putting order to a disordered, chaotic universe. And that's where you're at with a literature review. I mean, I have literally seen people with piles of papers on their desks, feeling like they were drowning, not knowing what to do. And if you don't have some way to create some order, some structure to that literature, you're going to feel like you're drowning. Um, and so... Uh, I, I mean, that's kind of the, the, the solution is that keyword structure. And so Cynthia would be, and Sharon, be great to hear uh, from you if you have a structure. Now, Cynth uh, Sharon already mentioned some different dimensions uh, of, of her topic, disability, gender, identity, education. So one kind of structure can, can be looking in these sub themes, uh, different angles of looking at the problem and kind of allocate the literature. What do the literature say about each of these elements? That can be... Uh, a good way yeah. to go. Courtney, what are some I other think, ways of finding structure? Well, 
Well, I was just saying in that case, you know, in Sharon's case where she already has an idea of what some of the themes might be, it can be as simple as signposting when you're writing. So mm -hmm. just saying, I will discuss these five uh, issues in, in this order. And then really you're just going through and you're talking about, I'm going to look at the studies that have to do with disabil disability, the ones that have to do with gender. So it can be as simple as, as that, just signposting. Yeah. Um, Yep. And, and you know what? I, I, I personally, I really like that. I think that's the easiest, I think that's the easiest uh, way to go is make things really simple on yourselves in, in your structure of writing. You know, when I read the New Yorker or something, if you want really good Pulitzer Prize winning prose, read the New Yorker, you get these winding double helix structures and fancy things, but really just a simple outline. That's point one, point two, point three. Uh, maybe a big section that again has point one, point two, point three that follows on from the next. Um, even could even be a list. Um, don't make it harder than it has to be. The science is complicated enough. Your goal is to again take that complex material, find a structure that makes it easy for the big points in your literature review to come out. Now, Courtney, what I see some students do is sometimes they just they they take the approach of like, okay, I'm taking notes on each individual article and I have these scattered sets of notes of the article. How do they go about taking those scattered sets of notes then and threading that into a structure? What do they need? What do they need to do? Well, I would say first and foremost is you really it can't just be that you're looking at articles and you're and you're copying pasting notes into a word document. You really need to to understand what is happening in those studies to be able to, you know, write your literature review in a in a great way. Um, so it's. I wouldn't think of your literature review as a copy and paste job and just a way to to you know grow your your references. Um, you need to understand what's happening in those studies. And mm -hmm. once you do that, you know, as you read through studies, you'll start to see different patterns. And when you see those patterns, make notes of that. Um, and I think you know eventually you're going to start getting a clear idea. Once you know all of your studies, you're going to be an expert in this area, and you're going to start to see patterns, and and that's going to help you decide how to write up your. Yeah. No, no, uh, I'll add to that. So I do actually like Courtney taking, say, if I go into Google Scholar and I have some nuggets to pull out, I might have in a Word document. Um, might be easier to just show this uh, as an example. Let me um, let me share the screen again. So I actually don't mind, say, if I go into Google Scholar here and say we're going to look at something on, I don't know, just something randomly, unemployment and health, and I say, okay, here's an interesting paper. Um, I might have my working Word document, and, okay, here's a, here's a Word document over here, and I might say, okay, this is pretty interesting. Um, this paper's about this, and you don't want to plagiarize, but it's totally okay to copy and strip out some key points so you can remember the paper. So I might note for myself, this is Dooley et al., whatever the year is, so I can remember, and start as I read through it, start taking out some key points, strip those out, move those over, so at least I have a placeholder um, to analyze key themes. One thing I do want to backtrack for a second, there are two broad types of literature reviews that, that you can consider. Um, the one that we really advocate in our group a lot is a systematic literature review where there's a kind of structured method for the analysis for the approach so that you won't get lost. They also tend to be easier to publish and they're really important for the field of science as a whole to avoid this pestilence, this plaguing science called publication bias, where people publish a lot of false positive findings. Won't go into too much detail about that, but if you're interested, let me know. And the other is just kind of good old fashioned type of narrative literature review, which is what most of you are going to be doing, where you go hunt around for a few articles, maybe you're using Google Scholar, and you want to put them uh, put them together in some structure framework. But yeah, Courtney, personally, I mean, how, how have you done it? This is the way that I've done it because I find I need to have some way to look at the data in this kind of narrative literature review, find some way to, to, to start to see the patterns emerging. Otherwise, if at once I'm above 20, 30 papers, I, I start getting lost personally. So I, yeah. I might have a few of these. I might have paper one, I might have paper two, three, and then and then start reshuffling and reorganizing them. Yeah, do do I do some, yeah, I do something like that. I do take notes, but I think I... I do sort of more mind mapping drawing out. So drawing out how things are relating to each other as I'm reading, um, trying to, to try and build up the pattern that's emerging as I go. So there, there's some definitely some cool tools uh, for doing that. Let me share one tool that I like for mind maps. And let me see if I'm uh, interpreting this the way 
the way that you do this, Courtney. Um, so let me sign here. So Miro is a tool that a lot of uh, we use with a lot of our students. And uh, let's just create a board here. Um, really great for creating these kinds of mind maps. So let's create a new board. And uh, yeah, Courtney, just let me see if I'm following logic. So let's say we were going to take something like what we're doing, say unemployment and health. And let's uh, zoom zoom this in. Okay. Right. So we can come here and then you could maybe say, okay, well, health, I got to deal with the physical health. Oops, that's not very pretty. Um, and then maybe mental health. Is, is this kind of how you're doing it? And then maybe yeah. as you get more information, you might not know as much at first. You, you start with unemployment and health. I read more and say, oh, actually, I need to deal with not just uh, unemployment. Um, I need to deal with somebody losing a job. I need to deal with other things. You kind of refine your understanding you, and you refine your mind map. I need to deal with not working enough hours. So under employment. Um, and yeah, uh, is this kind of the way you, you go yeah. about this? Yeah, absolutely. And then I'll, um, like if, a, if an article has something interesting to say, let's say about unemployment and the mechanism to health, um, then I'll make a note there of the of what that idea is and, and the reference. The so then you come really. here and say, okay, Dooley et al., yeah. 1996, here had an interesting point to make uh, on, on this nexus. Yeah. And, exactly. and yep. organize it quite this way. I think it's also a really nice way way to do it. Um, I think it's really important. So this, guys, would be an example of a type of conceptual framework or mind map or logic model. There's different terms for it. But I, I think it's really important to try to get this kind of a, a, an organization of your thinking. I'm a visual person personally. So I really, I really like this. Uh, and we got a question in the group. The name of the program is Miro, just uh, Miro.com. Might be a little hard to see here. I'll see if I can uh, zoom in on oh, no, It's not letting me, let me zoom in here. Not letting me zoom in. But yeah, Miro.com. I'll just pop that in the comments here. 100% um, free. And it's just a nifty little tool. You could do this in PowerPoint. Um, uh, anywhere else. I just find this is particularly easy to work with. By the way, guys, if you're finding things uh, helpful, do do hit like. It helps us to reach more people in, in the program. So if there are things you like that was particularly insightful that Courtney's saying, uh, or you agree with it, just hit like uh, to let us know. Uh, okay, I'm going to keep going. Uh, yeah, another person asked, what is this tool? It's called Miro. Uh, yeah, so let's go in. Let me go into Google. I'll zoom this so you can see a little bit better. And uh, screen does not want to zoom very easily. Oh, come on. And now it wants to crash on me. Uh, okay, there we go. All right, well, Google's doing something funky. There we go. So, yeah, just go to Miro. When you go to Miro, it's going to be the top hit. So, yeah, check that software out. I mean, we don't get any. Uh, it's 100% free. Um, we don't get any commission or anything. So we just recommend to you guys the, the tools that we found most helpful and what we use with our students personally. 100% uh, free for making those mind maps um, and a great way to organize your literature. The other thing you can do on those boards um, that, that's helpful is to, let me pull it back up again. Um, you can also just drag and drop papers into it. So for example, I had the Dooley paper before that we're just looking at. Let's see if we can pull this out. I'm going to save this. I'm going to go ahead and save this as a uh, PDF and show you what I'm talking about. Um, let's just save that into here. Okay. And then I'm going to come here and I should be able to drag this in here. Yeah. So I can just drag that in there. And uh, so now, now I've got it right there if I need to refer back to it. Um, again, th there are multiple tools. You need some system that's going to work for you to keep on top of this. So you don't feel overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, and I think like David said, like, David, you learned visually. I think I do a little bit too, but find something that works for you. Don't try and make something like this fit if that's, if it's, it doesn't come natural to you. Yeah. Um, and, if it's uh, taking notes in a Word doc and then picking up the patterns from there, then, then do that. Yeah. And I can see Sharon's actually joined us in the studio. Sharon, I can't see you on the camera, but uh, if you do want to jump on with us and do kind of signal to us or send us a message in the chat here. Um, okay, let, let me keep uh, going. I want to take a look at, at the next uh, question that, that came up to us. And if you have more questions, guys, about how to approach the literature review and how to start consolidating, um, then, then do get in touch. But again, I think the take home message here for me, Courtney, is that that consolidation is going to come by identifying some structure and importantly in that structure, kind of overarching themes or, or 
or these arrows that we have on the mind map to to organize your thinking and the main <laughs> insights. Okay. Um, so let's go to Maria. So Maria writes and says, uh, my name is Maria Bacola. Uh, no stranger to us in the group. Maria, it's so, it's so good to have you submit to us. Um, I'm a family doctor for, from Greece. And for this week's session, I would like to have feedback for my second article of my thesis. Um, I wrote it in parts and it might not be so well written. Your comments would be really helpful in order to improve it. Okay. So we're going to take a look at that. And this links to another question that we had, um, that came from Natasha, which is also more than 140 characters. So I'm going to have to read it out to you. And Natasha says, for today's topic, I'd be interested in any useful tips for identifying and defining research gaps. It seems sometimes it's difficult to determine gaps before reading the literature. So these two are going to go together because we're going to show an example uh, in uh, of the first thing that we're going to look at in a paper. First thing that I look at when I get a paper landing on my desk to review is, um, what's the gap? That this paper is trying to address. Uh, is this important? Is this meaningful? And then I'm going to look and see how well the paper has executed it. I mean, you can have a paper that's done a fantastic, beautiful technical analysis on something that's not a gap, doesn't really need to be done, is not important. And um, yeah, no, no one's going to want to bother to read it. So the the gap is really kind of where where the, the money's at here. So yeah, let's dive in, into that. Um, so let me pull that up. Hang on. I'm going to share my screen again. Um, uh, so I'm sh shuffling multiple screens. I can't do everything. Else. So, okay. So here is Maria's manuscript. And I think the, the most important thing to do is to look for the gap right away. I'm going to zoom in. Can you see this Courtney? Yep. Right. Okay. So sometimes you might have the gap in the title. Um, can't really see a gap here. Unless I'm blind, but no gap here. Let's look and see how long it takes us to find the gap. Um, hmm. I see an objective. And I see a hypothesis. Don't really see a gap. You see a gap, Courtney? No, I think you're no. right. Not seeing a gap. Okay, so we, we don't have a gap yet. So hard to know if this is important or not. Let's keep going down. Maybe in the introduction, we're going to find a gap. Okay. Tell me if I'm going too fast. I'm just kind of skimming through. You don't even have to read everything. Yeah. One of the stronger predictors. So this is all talking about things that have already been done. Okay, this is this is the closest thing to a gap that I've seen. Yeah. Okay. I I think that's that that to me is probably the the main gap that this paper has identified. Uh, and you know, Maria, uh, you know, uh, you know me with a group of fierce, but loving, but, uh, this is a very, very weak gap. It doesn't mean it's actually a weak gap. It just means the way you presented it makes it look like this is kind of a low value gap. That's not very interesting. It would be like, I don't know, take something for our school, say, I'm going to not analyze the amount of tomato content in a packet of ketchup because no one's there's scarce research on it. Um, you haven't yeah. created the argument for that. This is really meaningful. This needs yeah. to be done. Now, if I took that ketchup packet and I said, look, we've had counterfeit ketchup packets, some that have been contaminated. And the thought is, it's coming from some artificial tomato products. So we're going to actually see if the contaminated ketchup, uh, is linked to tomato. You have given us a little bit more of the context for why I actually care about looking at the tomato content in ketchup. So I kind of think we need a little bit more here to explain why is this so important? Um, so why is this an important debate? And, and for me, sometimes the gap, right, needs to connect to that debate. Um, you know, they're saying this, they're saying that everybody's arguing about this, but what they haven't done is this, and that's going to help me. That's really missing here. Um, what, what, what's your thinking on this, Courtney? Yeah, I'm thinking along similar lines. I mean, we can tell, right, that Maria knows so much about 
this literature because she's written so yeah. much here just about um, length of stays in voluntary admissions. Mm. Um, but all of this, Maria, that I think you've written so far is a few paragraphs. I think you're going to end up editing and putting just you're going to summarize this in like one or two sentences and then you really need to focus on why do we care about uh, length of stay in the correlates and in involuntary admissions that's really what the focus needs to be on yep 100 percent. so almost the order needs to be uh, inverted to very quickly get to you know what's the big issue and what's the gap every introduction needs okay. this and that's really make or break for your paper. If you watch in the group, we have a session with the executive editor of The Lancet, um, Jocelyn Clark. She's actually now moved on to be an editor of the BMJ, but uh, British Medical Journal. Um, and she said the, the key thing that she looks for is that there's a clear, simple message. And if you don't have the gap right, you can't have a clear, simple message to your paper. Um, so this paper, I think, has the makings of something very promising. But it needs uh, first step. So, Maria, what I suggest for you is to reverse engineer and explain this gap in a, 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 a stronger way. Courtney, how would you go about then for, for Maria? What, what steps does she need to take to articulate this gap? Given, you know, and, and I think it was really helpful that you pointed out that she knows so much. And sometimes knowing so much actually trips people up. It's one of the reasons I see some of the more intelligent, bright students struggle the most sometimes they get kind of lost in, in the trees and they, they can't see that proverbial forest but what yeah what do you think she's got to do i think she needs to to make the case very front and center and in, in the first sentence is why we should care about what the core list of length of stay are in involuntary admissions what's special about involuntary admissions and why should we care about them yeah it's, yeah, it's just on a simple level. And I, now I'm kind of impro improvising because I don't know. But firstly, if somebody is involuntarily being put in the hospital, that sounds pretty significant. That sounds like a yeah. massive infringement on people's freedoms. So um, already I'm kind of concerned about people involuntary against their will potentially uh, being put in an institution. And then a length of stay, like being involuntarily put in there for a long time. This gives me some cause for concern. So I think it's not a bad thing to connect to that. Like, why do we you know you're doing this research for a reason? Connect to that passion. Um, it, we have these emotions because it gives kind of meaning to life, gives weight to, to what, why we care about things. And that's okay to tap into. It doesn't make you less of a scientist uh, to do that. So um, this kind of, that doesn't really, to me, capture that, that why is this so important. Um, yeah. Do you have any ideas? Again, uh, I might not have the answers for this, Maria, but I'm, hopefully this can trigger some thinking for you. What, what do you think, Courtney? Any, any thoughts? Coming yeah, well, this, I mean, this statement is saying that mental disorders should be treated in less restricted environment, but that would go against, I guess, involuntary admission. So... Yeah, this seems so, to so, set the stage for why we should be worried about involuntary. Yeah, so so I think your your story becomes very simple. Your first paragraph can be: Look, across Europe, um, there's been a big move to having less restricted environments that are patient centered in rehab. However, a sign that this is not working is uh, you know against this trend. There's been this increase, or there's been a concerning pattern of people being involuntarily admitted in these restrictive areas for very long stays. And in this paper, you know, there's not much research. We don't know why this is happening despite these policy changes. Um, we want to see, is this happening to certain vulnerable groups or people who might be placed in these long stays against their will, don't have family support to, to help them avoid and being put in these bad situations. I look, yeah. I don't know, but that is a way that you might go really important thing going on here. Uh, but the, there, there's this concerning thing happening and we don't really know why. Very simple narrative. Um, yeah. Um, what, what do you think, Courtney? Could that work? Yeah, I think that works. Um, so, yep. And, and the other thing, Maria, just to say, uh, that peer system I mentioned earlier that's going to help you, each paragraph needs to make one point. And your, your paragraphs are a little bit like, um, you know, it, it's like you tried to put a little bit too much into them. There's just a whole bunch of stuff smushed together. Um, so... 
really try to to make sure you got a topic sentence making one point and then everything backs that up. If that is not clear to any of you guys, go straight to our writing training. Check it out. We also have a fantastic gap training. Again, if you go search in the Facebook group for gap, you're going to find the best identifying your gap training from Courtney and I. You're going to get a ton of value out of it. Almost if you're doing research, you're not confident about your gap. Um, that is indispensable. Um, okay, hang on. We got another question uh, that came uh, back on the literature review talk. But I just want to take that quickly before we go on with Natasha's part of the question. So, um, I feel when I assign someone to my to work for me on literature reviews, they they don't understand and mess things up. How to keep everyone in the team on the same page? Um, yeah. So, uh, Courtney, what do you what do you think about that? Me personally, my immediate re- reaction is why. Do you have multiple people working on a literature <laughs> review? Um, I, I don't recommend that. Um, when you do a systematic review, you might have a certain clearly defined role that you're having somebody come in uh, to do a review for. But the problem on the literature review is there's, it is indispensable that somebody's got to synthesize the insights from the review and understand it to put it together. And you can't just kind of cut and, and paste different people's insights and understandings uh, together. It just won't won't work. Um, what do you think about that, Courtney? Yeah, if it's, I mean, if this is in regards to a systematic review, there are ways to like pilot uh, certain processes like the extraction stage or the screening stage to make sure that everyone is on the same page in terms of what should and shouldn't be included. But if this is just a, if you're hiring a research assistant to, to do a literature review, then it's a, it's a bit different. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think if I, I, I were hiring, um, we actually just did this for a paper in the British Medical Journal. And so what we did is we had created an out, it was on misinformation and health. It's going to be coming out soon. We actually did it with several people in uh, the Fast Track community. Really fantastic cross-disciplinary collaboration. Excited to see it come out. Um, but what we did to avoid it feeling like it was written by a committee and different parts that didn't add up. We had everyone take on a specific section and do a literature review of just that subsection or sub theme of the problem. Um, And then afterwards we kind of made that writing style coherent, uh, uh, but made sure that everything was done in in a fairly consistent kind of way. Um, So that would be one thing, thing to do kind of set specific boundaries and borders on a component, a defined discrete self-contained component of the literature review I think it's definitely the way to keep this manageable for me personally. Um, okay. Uh, let, let's keep going on that. Good question though. And uh, Maria, glad. I think this is you. you re- rewrite it in the way that you said. Yeah. Glad glad to see it. And do send us. I mean, it's nice to share with people in the group. Uh, I think they'd like to see how this paper evolves. I think you have some good stuff here. Um, yeah. Really look forward to seeing this. Um, let me come back. I want to come back, though, to uh, the questions that, that we had from – make sure we've covered Natasha now. So Natasha um, asked us just to remind everybody. Um, I'd be used to, interested in any useful tips for identifying and defining the research gap. So I think that helps a little bit uh, defining the gap for identifying the gap. Um, it's difficult to determine gaps before leading, reading the literature, Natasha, 100%. I, I don't think you can just sit on your chair and philosophically – you know, ruse about what might be the gap. Um, I just think that's hard to do. I think you kind of go roll up your sleeves and start reading. Uh, how do you go, Courtney, when you, you've got a lot of success finding really important gaps that have helped you publish well, how do you identify the gap? Yeah, I think, it, I think you're right that you have to somewhat saturate yourself with the, with the literature. Um, if you're, I guess if you're starting like a PhD project and you're trying to find, you know, what should I focus on specifically, um, you can just start using tools like um, Google Scholar or PubMed or what have you to, to start reading around the ideas. I mean, the first thing I would always look for is whether there's been a systematic review on the topic that you're interested in, because yeah. often that will point you in the direction of gaps. Um, otherwise, it's, yeah, you're about just sitting down and, and reading things and really becoming familiar with what's going on in the literature. Um, jot down ideas as you write. I wouldn't expect to, to spend a day reading articles in Google Scholar and then figuring out my gap from there. I, I, I would typically have to read things, let it sit, read some more, let it sit. And you know, it's, it's that kind of process. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're right, Courtney. There's something, there's definitely an effect of kind of like your, 
your, your subconscious is churning with everything you've just read. You sleep on it. You go to the gym. You, you go for a walk. And then ideas hit you. It's important to give yourself some space to do that um, and, and not really put yourself in a corner where you have to do this under intense pressure. I found that, that really, really limiting. Got a, got a couple uh, other questions I want to take on this. Um, asking, is there a limited number of studies to uh, use as literature? I, I think you might mean, do you, is there a number of studies that you need for a literature review? And um, I mean, I think if you're doing a review, if you just have two or three studies, you don't have a literature review. You're, you're just kind of, Maybe your field's very small, or there's just not enough to actually review. So I, I think you've got to be above about eight papers. What, what, there's no hard and fast rule on this, but I think if you you don't have eight papers included in your review, you don't actually have a review. Yeah. Yeah, if this is a systematic review, I would say, yeah, that number. I think the lowest I've ever seen is six. Mm. Um, if yeah. you're doing a narrative review for your PhD, though, you need to, it'll be, a significant higher, significantly higher number of papers you'll be referencing. And essentially you need enough that someone is reading your work and you're anticipating their potential objections to it and you're answering them. If someone's reading your work and they can think of all these weaknesses then you don't have enough references because you should be anticipating those weaknesses and addressing them in your work. Yeah, yeah exactly. They, they want to know that um, I mean, especially you want to feel confident going into your defense uh, that you can answer any question they've thrown at you. You don't want them to say, well, hey, hang on a second. What about, you know, Dooley and colleagues in 1996 said this? And you're like, oh, and you kind of got egg on your face because you missed a seminal paper in the field. You don't want that to happen to you. So yeah. um, if a you nice are doing way, it, yeah. A nice way for sort of reading around your literature is to use Google Cited by feature so you can see you know, if you are reading a seminal article or, or describing it in your literature review, see how other people have discussed it in later work. And you can go into Google, um, look up an article, and it'll show you who cited that work. And you can look at what other people are saying about it and bring their views into into the picture as well. That's yeah, a good way to... Just, to, just to show that, uh, Courtney, glad you mentioned that. Let's go back to that Dooley unemployment article. And you can see that that's been cited a whole bunch. You mean just scanning here, Courtney? Yep, just scanning here. Yep. yep. And this is one way to snowball. So I found this. I'm going to look at what it's cited or what, you know, what cited it. And you might even look at what it's cited both ways and you, you can extend your search that way. Yep. Um, so, yep. I also personally, I really like in, inside Google Scholar to look and uh, restrict by year, I want to know what's really recent. So I might sort this yeah. by date. Um, whoops. Uh, well, anyway, just to, to give you an idea here, unemployment health, here's the stuff. Okay. Now you can sort this by, by date and figure out the most recent things coming out. If you find that's not quite on track, leave it by relevance, but say since 2021 to keep more recent things. Um, so that will help you capture some of the older, maybe seminal papers that have lots of sites. But also go back and um, in uh, f find the more recent things where the conversation is at now in in your field, and that can be really helpful for finding the gap as well. Yes, um, there there are more advanced tools for Google Scholar. You can do things with the uh, Publisher Paris Search. I personally don't use those because if you're going to do start doing a structured, uh, more systematic review, um, then you want to get out of Google. Um, and get into replicable inventories and databases like Web of Science, like Science Direct, like PubMed. Um, so, yep. Yeah. Oh, uh, Abd, uh, Abdi Fata. Hope I'm not pronouncing that wrong. Hope that helps. Um, okay, we've got another one that a submission that we had. That this one we can put in here. Although I didn't send my paper, my question is: Can I identify gaps in positive and negative impact of mass media on society? The topic is the role of mass media in peace development. Um, so. Uh, yeah, Cor Courtney, do you want to have a crack at that? Sure. My initial feeling is, of course, you should look at the positive and negatives, because if you focus on one or the other, then you're always going to have someone objecting that you're focusing on one or the other. Yeah. And you, you're ignoring all the good, but focusing on the bad or vice versa. So um, it's certainly a good idea to acknowledge both both sides of, of what the impact of mass media on society is. 
Yeah, so Courtney, I, I think this would be a nice example to for ourselves, again, not being experts in the field, to uh, try to take make kind of a conceptual framework using uh, using Miro and maybe using our an example of what the, the fancy way people call this are DAGs or directed acyclic graphs. So let's try that. So remember, you defined your Pico. So and I think this actually has a pretty nicely defined Pico. Uh, of we're interested in the impact of the intervention. It's going to be mass media. You might want to refine this a little bit. Um, the population, you might want to know where. Are you looking at, I don't know, let's just say, let's say we're saying the U.S. I don't know. When you say mass media, that can be a lot of things. Do you want to say, is, do you mean newspaper, radio? Um, maybe you want to summarize. Maybe you think they're different. Uh, newspaper, radio, social media, like Facebook, Twitter. Don't know. Need, need to kind of be clear about that. And your outcome, you said peace development. So peace development, maybe you're not thinking about the U.S. Um, I'm not really sure what you mean by peace development. That's kind of a an unclear outcome to look at. Maybe you want to look at um, some outcomes that have been looked at recently are called polarization. Uh, people having like very, very fragmented views and attitudes that don't really, that, that combat each other and don't really find any points of uh, intersection or agreement. So I might change it like that just for the sake of example. And I think I would change this to say, um, why don't we say TV to, to make this easier in the U.S.? Because then I can already think now, if I think of the TV, I might think Fox News. I might think MSNBC and other, exa and other examples like this of different news stations. Okay. So um, let's look here. So now we can kind of create a map. Um, what do you think? Does this work, Courtney? I, I, yeah, I mean, this looks good. Taking some liberties here. You can adjust it as you need. It's just for the example. So let's say we've got, um, uh, I don't know, let's just say Fox News. Okay. So, and we want to look at good and bad. What's the Fox News impact on polarization? And we'll, we'll be, let's be more specific and we'll call it political polarization. And, um, okay. So how can, uh, what, what kind of effects on, on people does Fox News have? Well, maybe, you know, the first thing is it's, the news is supposed to provide information. Provides information. That, how's that going to affect polarization? Um, okay. Uh, other ideas, Courtney, on, on how the, what what might be happening by the news? Um. It might be providing. Look, the Fox News is known to have a particular political leaning, so it could be providing pro Republican information, or or we'll just say party politic. Party politics. Okay. Um, what else, Courtney? Do, do you think? Yeah, I guess nowadays we have, unfortunately, to think about disinformation or misinformation. Yeah. So information, um, exactly. So that that's the kind of the fidelity of that information is here. So kind of, I guess, the information. Right, because you also have subcategory. That I feel like that's a subcategory that can go in your, your framework. So types of information, and you can have disinformation, misinformation. You could look at studies on to what extent is Fox News informative. Um, would be something you have to look at. Yeah. What else? What would be some other other channels? So these th these can this can go either way. So here, I think you have to look to say. This Fox News, if it provides good information, might – actually, that good information might help or might hinder polarization. We don't know. So this could be a positive effect. It could be a negative effect. We, we don't actually know. Um, same with the party politics. Part of, maybe you think if it's party politics, that's going to be a plus. That's going to increase increase polarization, um, pushing people out. Um what else? So, so there's different different ways you can think about this. You could also come at this in a framework of uh, a psychological framework of uh, another thing that it, it does is it might give salience to, it can frame, it can give salience to a particular issue. By salience, I mean it really draws your attention and makes this thing seem very important and other things less important. So that, that can highlight certain issues. So maybe Fox wants to highlight issues around trans rights rather than pay attention to, I don't know, war in Russia. Or, or the other way around. And so that can be framing. So you, you just need to find some kind of framework to help you organize this. But as I go through and think about this, it seems, you know, these are very complex effects and pathways um, linking these phenomena, describing this relationship that you're going to have to deal with positive and negative effects. Um, 
Uh, anything else come to mind here? And, and again, this is why you can't just do this from your armchair. You've got to go look up studies and see what they say about this and then re refine your thinking. Yeah, I think this also points to the importance of your PICO being very well defined um, mm. because you can just see how this could play out in so many different ways depending on what the population is, depending on what you mean precisely by peace development. Yeah, I think that's a big, bigger issue there. Peace development, I... I, I mean, we just came up with fragmented political views in a society, um, but I, I know you mentioned you want a peace development, so that's something you really got to um, got, got to just got to check um, for yeah. for yourself. Yeah. So yeah, glad you mentioned that. Everybody, 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 Pico. Look, we have a lot of tools in this group that we use. We use them for a reason because they help our students get clarity, um, and so. If you don't have that kind of crystal clear clarity, you're setting yourself up for a really tough ride. I would say, again, 90% of the students who come to us who are having massive problems, the symptom is that I'm struggling to write. Symptom is I don't know what to do. Uh, symptom is I'm not getting any feedback from my professors. Um, those are often symptoms. Underlying problem is uh, you, you got an issue with your gap. Um, you don't have clarity on your topic or your PICO. Um, you don't actually know what you want to say or what you want to write because you haven't done the hard work to create that structure and get clarity yourself first. Um, does that fit with your experience, Courtney? And, and yeah, kind of yes, the challenges definitely. Come to us with? Yeah, definitely. I often mm. find that we're looking backwards and say, okay, what was the research question? And why did we then from the research question working backwards? Okay. Why did we have this research question? Where is the gap? Yeah. Um, yeah. So if yeah. you can do this kind of work early on, it, it pays off so much. Yeah. You know, one of the frustrating things, I think, is when students come to us and it's two weeks before a thesis is due and they're like, help. And I'm like, sad reality. <laughs> Just had this with student Jasmine. I'm like, Jasmine, it's, it's too late. And then on the other side, I get students who come to us and say, well, I haven't even started my thesis yet. Um, it's probably just too early. And that's actually the right time. To, to get started and think about these things um, before you set the train in motion uh, going towards a, a dead end or a wreck. You want to kind of shift track before you end up in that situation. Uh, we've got another comment here. Okay. The question, the question, okay, this is kind of shifting gears a little bit. I think I found a gap in my field. Okay. This is good. Started. Pretty, oh, okay. Yeah, so this is uh, this I see it can be a real challenge. This is a structural challenge. So the the question at the bottom here is, what's the fastest way to become an independent researcher? Um, yeah, this is a you you put yourself in a structurally difficult situation. Um, yeah, Courtney, yeah. thoughts. Yeah, I think it's a situation that a lot of people find themselves in nowadays. Uh, you finish your PhD, maybe even in your you get a postdoc, but it's, it's a funded postdoc under a specific project. All the while you're trying to become an independent researcher, but you're doing other people's research or research ideas. My main piece of advice here would be to find a way to carve out some time for yourself and to develop your idea. Try and if it's just one paper that you can get out on that idea to sort of plant your flag on that idea as being yours, then to do that. Um, because yeah, most of your, if you're funded by this lab that's about a different topic, you'll have to do the work for that lab and you'll have to, whatever you agreed to, whatever experiments you need to run or papers you need to produce, you need to do that for that lab, but find a way also to to spend some time on your own ideas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, nobody's going to win a Nobel Prize as a grad student. So if you have this awesome idea that's going to get big amounts of funding, it's actually a little bit risky to uh, plant that out now because that credit's probably going to go to your supervisor um so um you know uh, up to you if you are 100 percent sure that you got a really winning idea um then the phd might not be the right time uh for that if you want that to be your baby that you nurture and nurse on your own um that said when you're on a phd in a prestigious lab on a different topic i think it can be really quite hard if you're not really passionate about that area. If you feel like it's just taking away time from what you really want to be doing. I mean, your ideal situation is if you're in a lab, uh, you have that really great alignment 
that your professor is really top in that area, investing time and energy in you, and you're doing exactly what you love and want to do. Um, so I'm, I'm a little concerned about you just because these, this gives me a few red flags that, um, the, d- d- that you might be down the road for frustration here. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I think one of the challenges, especially if this is in a lab, is to do the actual lab work, you need resources, you need tools, you need materials. And uh, unfortunately, there's start- startup costs. And it's one of the issues and reasons why the rich get richer in science and the poor you know, can't even get a seat at the table. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe is there another lab that at least works in that space? Maybe outside your lab, you could go do an internship at, or maybe you could do a rotation or find some way to connect with. Um, if there's some way you could find a way to connect this, uh, to, to, as Courtney said, I think a really good point about planting a flag. So at least you kind of get associated with this idea early on. Um, could be a really valuable step, even if you can't fully execute it. Um, yeah, because also, I mean, if you're working on your PhD, David, then what kind of fu- other funding could you be going for? Because, I, I mean, ideally, you'd have to finish your PhD first and then have a fund- a funded project, right? Yeah, I think you exactly. I mean, ideally, then you try to apply for this out of your PhD. But the problem then you've got is my PhD was on this. And now I'm applying for a postdoc in something completely different, especially in the science. Often you're still going for a postdoc in that space. And so, um, yeah, I, 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 again, this is, this is not that, that easy, easy to achieve. Um, again, depends what it is. Um, you know, for, for me, I, I, when I was doing my PhD, I could do side projects because the barriers weren't high for the material. So I could find a data set, and I could mine those data, perform the analyses, uh, and publish papers on my own on topics outside my PhD. Um, so that independence was there. If you're dependent on lab resources, it, it's hard to be independent because you are dependent on, on the equipment. So I, I don't have when any I, solution there. Yeah, it's just thinking out loud, you know... One idea, and it depends on your supervisor and your relationship with your supervisor, is to discuss the idea with your supervisor and see if there can be some space made for you to use resources and such. Um, what's your thought on that, David? Yeah, so I definitely have had students come and ask me, and I think that's a really nice way to approach it, uh, is to say, hey, look, I've got this pet project I'm really passionate about. Look, if I deliver on everything I got to do for you, can you give me a day? Or if I work in this outside of my own time, is that okay? And I've always been happy with that. I'm not happy if I've got a grant and students got to deliver on the project and they're falling behind because they're doing something completely in left field. But um, I think being open and transparent about it um, will, is the best way to go rather than have a professor discover later that you've been doing all these things behind their back when they thought they were funding you to do something else um, that could scupper your recommendation letter could, could create some problems for you down the road. So that's really, really, I'm really glad you mentioned that Courtney. I think that's, that's really important. Um, okay. I think we covered that. So let, let us know what you decide to do. Um, but I'm glad you asked that. I think that that's something a lot of people struggle with. Uh, the real transition to independence, I, I think comes mostly at the postdoc stage um even if you feel very independent now that's typically structurally career-wise where it happens okay we got a follow-up question on peace development what should i do on peace development i got your points on the other part of the topic well um the problem is peace development's not really that well defined um as an outcome and look we can we can see that just by looking in uh google scholar on the topic so let's go to google scholar and let's say mass media whoops on the wrong screen. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. Hang on a second. Sometimes my keyboard does not want to cooperate. And okay, there we go. Sometimes I'm recording things slow down. Mass media peace development. And uh, you can see here, we don't see peace development in here. We see uh, peace build media contributions to peace building. There's some here media influences on peace development. Um, there's stuff on terrorism. Um, there's conflict, international conflict is a good one, and, and war. 
Um, so it's not, I'm not seeing a big conversation happening here. Right? If this were a clear outcome, peace development, we would see that. Now, maybe mass media and, and peace would be clearer and you could define peace. Um, it might be easier to say war because I think if we say, flip it and say mass media and war, we're going to get more. Um, the press in America, interpretive history, war in the media. Yeah, this is slightly more, uh, slightly more size. It looks like actually conflict is where we're seeing more. Uh, just from looking, I'm just scoping this out. Yeah, seems to see a little yeah. bit more on conflict and uh, mass media. Um, so yeah, you got you got to you. So this is us not knowing the topic, just uh, scoping this out. But yeah, you you need a clear outcome to define. And again, if we had a broad outcome like health, we can still break that down to mental health. And mental health, we can break down further into say depression uh, or schizophrenia or other things. So peace development. Is more like you're thinking of words like developing peace. Um, I think your outcome is going to be more of a, kind of a, a war, conflict, a state of peace, um, and the relationship yeah. is mass media helping to develop peace. Is mass media you know, helping to prevent war, and that's where you get that active component. So I ho hope that helps. Um, got, got another one here. Like I said, putting a flag is a great idea. There's one person I can go to do first conceptual work. Good to know. I should start with it right now. I'm in a happy place with my PhD. Okay, excellent, excellent. No, I, I love to see that enthusiasm. And I actually like that idea then. If you have an, maybe another mentor out there who you could link with and start nurturing this project, that could be a nice bridge to the right kind of postdoc uh, that, that you want to get to and just kind of keep you satisfied. If you have this hard slog in your PhD, but you've got this other part you're excited about and you can keep the two distinct and you're your prof is happy with it, then, uh, then great. But yeah, I'd love to see that enthusiasm. Um, seems like several people are interested in this. More, I don't think you're independent when you're doing a PhD. You have to do what your supervisor wants. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in a lab. A lab is run like a small business and, uh, kind of like you got a boss and you got to deliver on that because they're right. When I, I've got money on grants and I'm hiring somebody, I got to deliver on that grant project. Um, and that's the bottom line. If I don't, I, I mean, my, I, I have to deliver a project. So you're working for me and paid to deliver that project. I, I have to make what comes in equal what a promise is going to come out. So uh, no, above and beyond that, if you've delivered and you've got it done, um, then then the flexibility. Uh, more to add on that, Courtney? What do you reckon? Yeah, I think that sounds right. Okay. Right, so I think this is a good point. We can do a dedicated session. We are on uh, independence during the PhD and beyond. Um, we are always open to hear your ideas and suggestions about what you're going to get the most value about, uh, what you're struggling with. And again, it's a safe space for us to go a bit deeper on that together. So yeah, if there's something you'd really like to see from us, drop us a comment, drop us an email. I'm at uh, David Stuckler, FastTrackGrad.com. Courtney's at Courtney McNamara, FastTrackGrad.com. Okay. Love hearing from you. Um, we are soon going to start our systematic review challenge series. I know I've been promising this, but I've been, uh, I had a little bit of chaos on my side with traveling and moving a bit. I know Courtney, you too, you're still from the cafe. So, uh, we're <laughs> making sure that everything, all we're firing on all cylinders before we launch that next chapter. Um, with that, yeah. Uh, Courtney, you doing anything fun this weekend? Um, nope. Still unpacking boxes over here. So. All right. Um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna go uh, de-stress at a gym session. Gotta practice what practice what we preach, um, guys. Hope you all have a great weekend. We will be in touch in the DMs, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye, bye, Courtney. Good to see you again. Bye, bye, guys.